a little before eight this morning and then left here, ran home, was home for about 35 minutes, ate and took about a 10 minute rest in my chair, got up, went to the nursing home, came back here, had been here, but I did stop for a Dunkin' Donut coffee. So we're gonna go until that coffee wears off, okay? So however long that is, that's how we're gonna go. Uh, Romans chapter eight, if you would, wonderful passage of scripture that we're going to go through tonight. I am really looking forward to this. We're going to talk about something very practical tonight that I think we ignore at times and we forget. So we're going to talk about that um, as we've studied. Of course, last week we had a guest speaker here, so we weren't able to meet together. But the week before, we talked about something about an anticipation of future glory. You remember that? Paul was reminding us that there is something better, there is something out there, there is something more. And uh, we talked just a little bit on that. We talked on this topic, uh, my perspective on life according to Paul. We were in verses 18 down through verse 25. And then before that, we talked about the fact that we are sons of God, we belong to God. And uh, because of that, do you see the progression here? Do you see how it it goes from being the son of God and saying, Abba, Father, and there's that close relationship to now there is this anticipation for future glory. And he, you remember in verse 18, he said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. He was beaten. He was stoned, he was shipwrecked, he was tortured, he would suffer in prison, he would be cold, he would feel betrayed, he would have people turn their back on him, he would have all this stuff, and he said, that's not even close to comparing it to the glory that awaits me. There's something far greater. We saw the theme, which was of hope. We can be, have a victorious perspective in spite of suffering. There's a man at a, a former church, um, when I was up in college, and uh, he was in a, a, a wheelchair and, or a chair, with the, he would guide himself around, but he could barely move. When he was younger, he was working construction. If I remember it correctly, he fell off of the scaffolding as he was working on a job. And since that point, he was paralyzed, other than he could move his hand a little bit and move his head just a little bit. And he was one of the happiest people I have ever met in my life. And I didn't know him that well, but every time I went to church, that man was there. He had a lot to complain about, but he understood this, con this concept. The future glory far outweighs any of the suffering that we have to go through. And that's what had to be in Paul's mind. For Paul to accomplish the will of God, he had to get off of that and get focused on the future glory. Now, I know this morning we talked about be patient in the Lord. If you think I'm going in a series, I'm not. That's just where we're at tonight in the book of Romans. So we see his perspective on life. We're not comparing our trials with the future glory. Not the shipwrecks, the beatings, the imprisonment, the life-threatening times, and the fear. There's no comparison. There's no comparison. So then last week we also saw the, the relationship between the suffering and the future glory. We even saw that creation groans. Uh, the creation is ready uh, to be, creation has suffered, and they're groaning for him to come back. And we saw the animal life. One day the lion will lay down with the lamb, and they're groaning for him to come back. And man, we have this future hope. So what do we do with that? Right? All of us would agree there is a future hope. But what does that mean for us, practically speaking? Okay, yes, it means we can have joy and we can have this, but I think what we're going to talk about tonight is going to make it more uh, applicable and kind of boil it down just a little bit for us. We're talking about future hope, so what does this mean for us? Go to verse 26, if you would, tonight. 26. Even though we go through trials, someone is there to help when we cannot. Look at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our what? Okay, this will kind of summarize the message tonight. When we are weak, we find help through the Spirit. The title of the message tonight is Help Through the Spirit. Help Through the Spirit. Of course, the Spirit is a part of the Trinity, no lesser than God the Father, God the Son. I know it's hard to grasp the Trinity, and I think some of our analogies that we try to use sometimes do it more of an injustice. We cannot explain the Trinity. 
I can't. Maybe, maybe you understand it better than I do. But what I do know, there's a perfect harmony. But there's no greater or lesser power among the Trinity. So we're going to talk about the Spirit tonight. When we are weak, we find help through the Spirit. The help, or excuse me, the Spirit helps in the here and now. Remember the previous verses, we're talking about future glory. What we can anticipate in heaven and the glories and the wonder and all the speculation of how beautiful heaven must be. Remember that song? How beautiful heaven must be. And we can speculate, right? We can sing that song and close our eyes and just imagine what a perfect place looks like. And there's no imagining because we have nothing to compare it to. We don't know perfection. You know, sometimes we joke, it's Hawaii, that's perfection. Well, no, it's not. They have hurricanes and stuff. No, it's not. You know, Florida, no, my sister's in Florida. They're uh, battening down the hatches right now, preparing for a hurricane. They're, she was just on her way to church. They were going two hours early because they're trying to get back before the rain starts. There is no place to compare it to. But let's be practical. Let's be practical. How can we have help here and now? Through the Spirit. Okay, let's pick this up here. Look at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Go to verse 27. And he that searcheth the what? The hearts. Go down to verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Friend, understand this. As we look at some things tonight, we need to understand in our text three things when we don't know what is going on. Our tendency is anger and bitterness and the question of why. We need answers. And that's just human nature. And that's what we're all going to do. We're going to ask why. What I'm pointing out here is we have someone on our behalf. And I just found so much comfort in this, especially this afternoon as I went over my notes and started to think this through. We see the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. God searcheth the hearts, and all things work together for good. Doesn't that sound pretty good tonight? Oh, man, that is something. These truths help us when we don't understand, when we base our confidence in Him. Um, you know, we are kept by the, by the power of God. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit, and that's a wonderful promise. But what does that mean practically? When we're going through the trenches of life, how does this help us practically? I want you to see the Trinity at work. God sends the Son. The Son sacrifices His life. The Spirit seals us till the day of redemption. Although we may not understand, we can know. I want you to write this down. I don't understand, but the Holy Spirit helps me. I don't understand, and it is okay to admit that I don't understand and I don't know. I don't understand, but the Holy Spirit helps me. Let's pick up in verse 26 again. The Spirit helpeth our infirmities. The idea, listen friend, listen friend, sometimes we belittle the Holy Spirit. Shame on us for having a poor understanding. Uh, you know, saying that God is better than the Spirit. That is, what are we talking about here? That's ridiculous. I want you to understand that the Spirit comes to our aid when we have a weakness. Now the word weakness here is the idea of, of, of uh, or excuse me, the word infirmities has the idea of weakness or sometimes it refers to health. Sometimes it refers to different things along those lines. But understand this, that the Holy Spirit comes to our aid as his children. What a comforting thought. I don't understand, but the Holy Spirit helps me. Um, uh, when I was younger, I remember we would, I've told some of this, but we would skateboard with my friends or we would play football uh, after church on Sunday nights. And we would, you know, most of our good clothes had holes in them or grass stains. Every service, my mom would always tell us, if you come home with grass stains, you're going to be buying your own clothes. Well, every service we came home with grass stains because we'd go out after church and me and the teenagers from the church, we had a larger youth group for a, a large portion of when I was in high school and we would go outside and we'd play football. And one time somebody brought their friend and he was a big guy. And I had confidence because at the time I thought I was the best football player at our church. I mean, there were only like seven of us, but man, I was the man on campus. 
<laughs> seven of us. And we went out there and we we're playing football. And I catch the football and I turn to run. And this kid, I didn't think he was that athletic. He, he played football. We found that out later. But he got down in a position and I turned and his shoulder went right here. It was a gut punch. And I fell down and I went, <gasps> he lost my breath completely. It's kind of what is talked about here. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. This is the idea when we have something like a gut punch that takes our breath away. Have you ever had news so severe that it kind of took your breath away? You ever talk to someone on the phone and you hang up the phone? You ever lost a job and you don't know what to say? That's what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about the fact when we wish we had a little more money in our wallet so we could buy a larger drink at McDonald's. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that literally rattles your cage or rattles your world. The loss of a job, the loss of health, the news that we hear when we've been swindled or taken advantage of by someone we thought we could trust. In the long history of con artists, there's a man, George C. Parker. Has anyone heard of him? No? Okay. Neither had I until I read this. He holds a special place of dishonor. He is remembered as one of the most successful and daring swindlers in American history. He set up an office in New York City and sold some of the city's most famous attractions to tourists. His favorite was the Brooklyn Bridge. He also sold the Statue of Liberty, the Madison Square Garden, and Grant's Tomb. He produced uh, elaborately forged documents and deeds to convince his targets that he was the rightful owner of the landmarks he was selling. He was so persuasive that on more than one occasion, police had to come and explain why the new owners of the Brooklyn Bridge couldn't put up toll booths to collect money. This happened time and time again. After his third conviction for fraud, Parker was sentenced to life at Sing Sing Prison in New York where he spent the last eight years of his life. He spent his life uh, preying on other people. Man, what a sick individual. But can you imagine that person for however much they bought the Brooklyn Bridge for to find out later on <laughs> it didn't belong to them. Talk about a gut punch. Talk about news that is hard to swallow. That's what we're talking about here. The Spirit helpeth our infirmities. When we don't know what to pray, when we don't know what to say, when we have no words, when we feel like we can't breathe, He's there to help us. The idea of He helpeth us is the idea of to assist us, to assist us. Look at this. Look at this. It, it, it's very interesting to me. When we know not what we should pray, the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The word infirmities means weakness or sickness. He helpeth. The word helpeth means assist. He comes to our aid. Who is this? It's the Holy Spirit. He's one of the Trinity. He's God. He is the Holy Spirit on our behalf. He has the power. He comes to our aid. You know what that tells me? I am not alone, even when I've been knocked down and can't breathe. The Spirit comes to my aid. The Spirit comes to my aid. He comes there. The only other place in Scripture that I can find this word uh, helpeth is found in Luke. Go to Luke chapter 10, and this is the idea I think that the author's trying to say. Luke chapter 10. Let me just try to explain what the Holy Spirit does when something happens that we can't, we don't even have words to say. It's so bad. It hurts so much. Luke chapter 10, this is the idea of where it comes from. Luke chapter 10, verse 40. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she what? So what was Martha asking Jesus to tell Mary to do? Come over here and help me with what I am doing. Come over here and assist me. Come over here and help carry the load so I don't have to carry it all myself. It's the only other place that this word that I can find is found in 
our Bible. It's the only other place that I know of, and it's the idea of come because I'm too cumbered down, I'm too stressed out, and I just can't feed everybody. I can't help everybody. This dinner was bigger than I thought, and can you please tell Mary to stop sitting there and come over and help me? The Holy Spirit comes to assist us in our time when we have no words in our time when we have nothing else to say, in our weaknesses where we fall short. So not only as Paul taught, there's a hope in a future glory, but there's also a help in our present suffering. Hope in future glory, amen? Our suffering is not to be compared with the glory that's coming, but practically speaking, how do we deal with the suffering today? I know heaven's going to be great, and I know all the pain will be gone, and in my mind, I understand all that, but how can I practically make it through today? You ever ask yourself that? I know we're all Christians and we're all, I know the cliche, you know, I, 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 all I know is the church. I've grown up in it. And all of us would say, yes, yes, we believe that. But sometimes we're like, God, where are you at? I've asked you and asked you and it's not working and it's not changing and I keep suffering and I don't know. And if everyone was honest, I would think that we've all been there before. What are you doing? I don't know what to say anymore. I don't even know how to ask you, God. So how do we pray? Has anyone ever thought about that? What do we pray? So there's several things. Do we pray for a cure or do we pray for strength to get through it? How do we pray? Do we pray for uh, the will of God or steady hands for the doctor? When you're at somebody's bedside, what do you pray for? Well, do you pray for a change of location because you're struggling with a place? Or do you pray for a change of attitude? What do you pray for? Do you pray for a change of finances? Or do you pray for a change in your spending habits? What do you pray for? Do you pray uh, that God would, would help you to quit being so mad over this person and what they've done? Or do you pray that you would grieve over them? What do you pray for? Do you pray, uh, what do you pray for in the future? And sometimes it's overwhelming. Anyone ever tried to pray and you didn't know what to say? There are people that I know God has brought judgment on for their lifestyle. I know that. I believe that with all my heart. What do I pray? God, would you take it away from them? Well, what if it's not God's will? There's a lot of things I don't know what to pray, but there is somebody who does know the will of God, who's praying on my behalf. Okay, we're going to see this unfold just a little bit, but the Spirit communicates with God, articulating my words for me. Because to be honest with you, just being real, sometimes I feel like my prayers are inadequate. Sometimes I feel, just to be real, I feel like, well, they're just going in this room and they're not going through the ceiling to where they need to go. But the Holy Spirit comes to my aid with a burden that's greater and he can understand and he can help me with the words that I don't know what to say. He prays in my place. He prays for me with compassion and understanding. With compassion and understanding. The Holy Spirit, he intercedes between me and God and he pr pr puts my prayers up in a better way. When I don't have all the words, he'll speak on my behalf. Because, friend, you and I don't always have the words. And sometimes we don't know what to pray for. And sometimes we don't know what to say. I think there's times where to come boldly through the throne of grace, but I'll be honest with you, with what God wants for us in a new church building, I don't always know what to pray. God, is this your will or not? God, I want to do this, but maybe it's just my flesh. Maybe it's something you don't want for me. So what I can have confidence in, when I don't know the answer, the Holy Spirit will intercede on my behalf with compassion. With a, with a comfort, he intercedes. He intercedes between me and God. God already knows the answer to the why I lost my friend. Why I lost money. Why the relationship didn't work out. The whys of life, God already has the answer. And when I don't know what to say, and when I'm grieving over somebody else, maybe their poor decision, and I don't even know what to ask God anymore about that person. The Holy Spirit will intercede on my behalf. When I say, God, I just want your will to be done in this situation, the Holy Spirit can plead the will of God because he already knows it. Because I don't know what the future holds for them. 
I don't know what the future holds for me. That's why I'm so glad the Holy Spirit prays on my behalf. So he prays to God on our behalf when we hurt so bad, we just groan and we ache. Look at the rest of this verse. And I need to move on to the next verse, but I think this is so important. The Spirit helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh the intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered with words. Now, some people say this is for tongues and to going back to 1 Corinthians. I don't necessarily believe that. What I believe is there's just words that you cannot say. You don't know what to say. You're so grieved. You're so overwhelmed. He is fighting for me. I remember several times I've told this before. Uh, you know, somebody hurt us very deeply. And um, I went and just drove. I ended up past Albany, and I was out past Dunkirk, and I just was weeping the whole time in my car. I was driving up there, and I was angry, and I was just frustrated, and I kept telling God, I don't know what to ask. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't have it. And I just kept driving and driving. I don't know really how far I got. I just know I was way out on some back road in Dunkirk. I just would drive and pray and weep. And, and I didn't know what to say that day. And I just kept asking God. And it's in those times when you feel like a gut punch that the Holy Spirit intercedes for you when you don't know what to say. Look here, uh, number one, I wanted you to see, uh, I don't understand, but the Holy Spirit helps me. Number two, I want you to write this down. I don't understand, but God knows my heart. Look at verse 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh the intercession for the saints according to the will of God. When I don't know the will of God, the Holy Spirit does. That's why prayer is so important. We're going to talk about that here in just a moment. But I don't understand, but God knows my heart. This is with the understanding that we are praying and seeking a relationship with him. Okay? These verses, it's not like I don't have to pray because the Holy Spirit's just going to go to God. No, no, no. These verses are with the understanding. Meaning that someone is seeking a relationship with God and somebody is actually praying, okay? Take your Bible, go with me to several verses tonight. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And I want to see if we can get a theme going here tonight. A theme from God's Word. Ephesians chapter 6. So the Holy Spirit will help me in my prayer. He will come to my aid. When I don't know what to say, when I don't know what to ask for, the Holy Spirit will help in that. But this is with the understanding that we are praying. We are seeking Him. Okay? Look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18, would you? Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication of the saints. What is the first word in this verse? Praying. Okay? I want you to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. 1 Chronicles chapter 16. First Chronicles chapter 16, this is in David's song of thanksgiving. After the ark came. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 11. The Bible says, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face, what? Continually. We could go to a few more. We're not going to tonight. Matthew 7, Luke 18. We could go to several more. But the idea is not that, well, I just don't need to pray because the Holy Spirit will say what I need to say. And what's the purpose? No, no, no. That, that, we, we've missed the whole point. The Holy Spirit will intercede on our behalf, yes. But it's with the understanding that we are seeking God and that we are praying. We are seeking His face. And when we have the pain that's so severe, we're seeking God, but we don't know what to say. The Spirit will intercede with compassion on our behalf. I don't have to have all the fancy words. There are some people who we would say they're, quote, good prayers. Whatever that means. Whatever that means. Because the Holy Spirit will take the, the, you know, the vocabulary that I may or may not have, and He can use it to offer before God. It's not about being a good prayer. It's about praying. It's about seeking God. I think sometimes we put too much emphasis on, why well, I don't have the words to say. Well, good. <laughs> Go to God and let God take care of that. I do think there is something about when you pray more and you're around people who pray, you, you, you learn to pray in a better way. That's not what, I'm not trying to misquote that. But just pray. Seek His face. Daily seek His face. Pray all the time. Pray without ceasing. 
And when you don't have the words to say, he'll take that. But number two, I don't understand. The Spirit helps me. I don't understand, number two, but God knows my heart. God is the one who brings deliverance. God is the one who brings deliverance. God searches the heart and knows my deepest need. Uh, did you know there is not a need I have that God overlooks? Because he knows the heart. There is not a need I have that God doesn't know, that God cannot fix. And when we go to God without the words to say, the Holy Spirit can intercede on our behalf. And there's not a need we have that God cannot take care of. Not one. And there's not a need that we have that God doesn't already know. Not one. You know, whenever I go in our kitchen, you know, they always say it's not lost until mama can't find it. You know, you go to the refrigerator, me or my kids, we go and it's not in here. And Quest will be like, yes, it is. Babe, I'm telling you, it's not in here. And I'm telling you, almost every time she'll come over to the fridge, I think she hides it from us is what I do. But she'll go to the fridge and she'll just do this. She won't say anything. I'm like, you know, just say something. This is embarrassing. But there's, my wife is very meticulous. I am not so much. I do the quick look. If it's not there, I go. With God, he sees every single need. There is not a need that you have that God doesn't already know. But God wants to hear you talk to him about it. I don't understand, but the Holy Spirit helps me. I don't understand, but God knows my heart. The Spirit is in tune with the Father. Look at verse 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what the, is the mind of the Spirit. They are in one unity. It's not like they don't know what the other is thinking. The Father and the Spirit, they're in tune. There is perfect harmony between the Spirit and the Father. God will answer our prayer and meet our needs. This will lead us into our final point tonight in verse 28. But I want you to see at the end of verse 27, he maketh intercession for the who? For the saints, those who are his, those who are praying, those who are seeking, the Holy Spirit makes intercession and puts into words things that we don't know. But notice what the end of that verse says, according to the will of what? I don't know the will of God, but the Holy Spirit will take that prayer from the heart it comes from and it will push the will of God. That's what my prayer will turn into. I don't know the future. I don't know what the will of God is. I don't know. I don't know what God has in store for my children. I don't know. What I pray for my children is the will of God. And sometimes I ask for things and God knows my heart for my children. My wife and I pray for my children to find a spouse. For Riley, it's when she hits 42. But uh, to find a spouse one day, we're, looking, we're, we're praying that God will bring that. And I don't know what the will of God is. I don't know who that person is. I don't know what where God's going to put my daughter. I don't know. But the Holy Spirit does and intercedes on things that I don't even have words to say, okay? Because I don't know the future. Once you see, thirdly, I don't understand, but God will work it out. I don't understand, but God will work it out. Okay, look at verse 28, if you would. Of course, a verse that we all know very well, but we've got to understand the context. As Paul is going in here, he's talked about the fact that there's no condemnation in the beginning part of the chapter for those who are in Christ. And then he talks about the Holy Spirit that dwells in us halfway through the chapter. And then he tells us that we can cry, Abba, Father, there's a relationship. And then we can look at the future and see there's no eternal doom. There's only eternal joy. And then he tells us if that's not enough, we we have a present person, a uh, uh, present of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, who speaks on our behalf to the Father. What more could we want? What do we have to worry about? Look at what the Bible says here. And we know, this is talking to the saints about the will of God. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Oh, friend, I don't understand, but God will work it out. I don't get it. Sometimes it's heavy. Sometimes I don't even have words to say. Have you ever wept so much that you can't even speak? Have you ever grieved so hard? That's what this is talking about. But then Paul goes into, because Paul knew what it was to suffer. He's like, but... We know all things work together for good. That word all, I think, is very interesting. I don't think I need a dictionary meaning for that. All things 
work together for good. The previous two verses, according to Grant Richardson, the previous two verses expound on the Spirit's intercession on our behalf so that our prayers are in the will of God. The succeeding verses show the goal of his prayers, and that is to be conformed to the image of the Father's Son. We can be certain of this goal because the Father predestined us to be like his Son. Now, we'll get more into that word, predestination, and I know that scares some of us, and it absolutely should not. It's in the Bible and we'll talk more about it, I think, going into next week. But we've got to understand I may not get it and I may not understand it all, but God will work it out. The Bible says this, we know. That word we know is uh, Christians know that God manages everything, right? God already has the end date for the universe. And he will work, and he already knows how we'll respond to what would happen. And everything is working to his perfect purpose and his perfect plan. He is in control. All things are going to work out. We know this. We understand this. So the idea of all things. All of it is used to conform us to his image. Listen, friend, I'm going to say something that's hard. And it's hard for me to hear, and it's hard for me as I was studying today. Stop acting like God made a mistake. Because God does not, will not, never has, never will make one mistake. So I need to treat him like he's perfect. And sometimes I don't. Sometimes I get angry. Right? I'm not the only one? Okay, good. Sometimes I get frustrated. I don't even know what to say. I've been so angry. I've sat at this pulpit right here, um, not as much anymore, but earlier on in the, the years, we couldn't grow and there was no money and I didn't know what to do and we had a roof to put on and we had stuff. Man, it was heartbreaking. And I sat here and I told God, why did you bring me to this place to suffer this for no money? What am I doing here? I'm working all this. What am I doing? The early parts of my ministry, I would sit here and that sometimes I would just grieve and sometimes I would pound that pulpit as I was kneeling down and I would just be like, God, I don't even know what to ask you. What do you want of me? What else can I do? I'd sit there right in this spot and would just weep and not even know what to say. But the Holy Spirit took those prayers and he used them for God's glory and God's honor. But all things should be used and will be used to conform us to his image. Notice what the Bible says in this verse, work together. He cooperates with our decisions to fulfill his plan or purpose for creation. The good is God's purpose. The Greek word, this is according to Richardson, the Greek word for work is the term from which we get the word, English word synergism. Synergism is the working together of varying features to produce an effect greater than the individual part. You see, with the Holy Spirit, with God the Father, with God the Son, with a willing vessel who's conforming to the image of Christ, who is praying, even though they don't always know what to say, they're working together to fulfill God's plan. All things work together for good to them that love God. The classification for this is twofold. Those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. Our love for God is due to the idea he has called us for salvation. The idea of the Holy Spirit has spoke to us. God is not willing that any should perish. God wants all to be saved. Some listen and respond. Some know it and reject it. All things work together. To his purpose. God directs these affairs of our lives toward his intended purpose. And we'll stop there because I want to spend time on these next verses for next week because I think they're very important. I don't think they're verses we need to, you know, fear that it's going to change our doctrine. But, friend, understand this, and I want you to take this home. You're not praying alone. The Holy Spirit is compassionate, and he is interceding according to the will of God. He is taking those prayers and praying the will of God. That's why you and I, we've just got to get time to pray. There is power in prayer. And it's not up to you having the right words. Do you understand how silly that is? Like you and I have the vocabulary that God does, right? That is so silly. That's nonsense. We have someone praying on our behalf. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. 
those times where you don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit will take care of that. We have a promise. We know. Paul just assumed. Christians, you know. Paul had lived a life as knowing all things are going to work together for good. To them who love God, those who put God first, to them who are called according to His purpose, those who recognize and understand what His plan and purpose is for them, it's all going to work for good. It's all going to accomplish God's grand scheme of things. Why He allows things, I don't know. Why does He do certain things? Friend, I don't know. But I do know this. We can look forward to that future hope, and we should. But we ought to understand we have a present Holy Spirit who dwells in us, who seals us, who speaks on our behalf through our prayers. The Holy Spirit. We're not alone in this thing. You understand that? You're not alone. You're not alone. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, even though we may not understand some things. We thank you that, uh, Lord, even though we don't have the words sometimes to put it, God, the Holy Spirit speaks on our behalf, and I want to thank you for the comfort you bring. Lord, I may not understand, but God, you search the hearts, and you already know what we're thinking and what we're doing, and there's not a need that we have that you don't know about. Not one. And God, you just want us to bring it before you. And you want us to, by faith, trust you. And then, God, you show us, even though we don't understand, you will work it all together for good. To them who love you, to them who are called according to your purpose. Lord, give us understanding with these thoughts. And Lord, next week as we finish this chapter, Lord, I pray we conclude it through your wisdom and through your word. We love you so much. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.